right, let's talk about the anatomy of the sympathetic nerves. So we have our spinal cord here. All right, we have our ventral horn, our lateral horn, and then your dorsal horn from this view. Okay, so this is your ventral horn. This is your dorsal horn. This is your lateral horn. Okay. Now, exiting the spinal cord, there are two roots. So we have a dorsal root and a ventral root. Okay. And then they're going to merge to form a spinal nerve. So this is your ventral root. Right. This is your dorsal root. And then they merge together to form your spinal nerve. Okay. These nerves will then synapse onto your ganglia here and then they'll continue to travel out to your affected tissue. So let's look at, let's look at uh, the fibers that are traveling. So the first thing we wanna make note of is that the fibers that innervate the sympathetic nervous system are going to come from the lateral horn, we mentioned this already, of the spinal cord. And just for reference, this is an image if we took a cross section of the spinal cord. So if you took the spinal cord, chopped it in two, and looked at it, you would see this uh, representation here. The fibers of the sympathetic system come from the lateral horn. Now they will exit the spinal cord through the ventral root. All right, this is them exiting through the ventral root. And they're going to enter the spinal nerve. Now, when they enter the spinal nerve, they're referred to as white ramus, right? And all that white ramus really means is that at this point, they are myelinated, right? They are myelinated. They're going to exit the spinal cord, enter that ventral root. They will eventually merge and become a part of the spinal nerve. And then they'll synapse into the autonomic ganglia. So that's just right here. This is your autonomic ganglia. And then within the autonomic ganglia now, they will synapse onto, let's put the synapse, onto a second neuron here, which is our postganglionic neuron. And this will be gray ramus. This will then re-enter the spinal nerve and head to the affected tissue. Okay, so at this point, this is called gray ramus, and all that that means is that it is now unmyelinated. All right, so let's just recap. Your fibers arise from the lateral horn of the spinal cord, they exit the spinal cord. At this point, they are called white rami or white ramus fibers because they are myelinated. They're going to enter the ventral root and then eventually make their way within this, into the spinal nerve. They will then leave the spinal nerve again, synapse onto that autonomic ganglia, which at this point is part of the sympathetic chain. They'll synapse onto that second neuron, which is your postganglionic neuron. So if we make this division here, this would be your postganglionic whereas this would be your preganglionic neuron. Right? And then they will then continue on re-enter the spinal nerve and make their way to those affected tissues.
right? So the take home point here is one, the fibers are coming from the lateral horn. Two, the fibers are in the ventral root. They exit the spinal cord in the ventral root. Three, they are white ramus fibers within the preganglionic neuron. Four, they become gray ramus fibers within the postganglionic neuron. Alrighty? Any questions on that? Any questions? Okay, let's continue on. All right, so let's continue on. So these two slides really just summarize that exact process that I just showed. Your preganglionic neuron exits the spinal cord by the ventral root, enters the spinal nerve. In this image, it's shown in that lighter blue color. Right? You can see the rising from the lateral horn, coming through the ventral root, making its way into the spinal nerve. At this point, it's all myelinated. It's going to be called white ramus. It'll synapse onto this ganglia. Remember, this ganglia is a part of the sympathetic chain. Synapsing onto a second neuron, which is this darker blue neuron here. That darker blue neuron is now unmyelinated, so it's gonna be called gray ramus. And it will then re-enter the spinal nerve, and the spinal nerve makes its way to the affected tissue. Right. Okay. And then the second option is if it didn't go to that sympathetic chain, but then it went to a collateral ganglia. So you just want to bear that in mind. Not all of these fibers are going to go to the sympathetic chain. Some of them can go to the collateral ganglia, which are ganglia that are elsewhere in the body, not a part of the sympathetic chain. All right. So that was the anatomy of the sympathetic division of the nervous system. All right, so don't get that confused with what we're going to speak about now. This is your parasympathetic system. And the anatomy of the parasympathetic nervous system is sort of the opposite of what we saw with the sympathetic nervous system. So there are fibers that arise from two areas. We mentioned this earlier, the brain stem, right? Cranial nerves 3, 7, 9, and 10. And then the sacral nerves, the sacral spinal cord. So S2, S3, and S4. And these fibers <clears throat> are going to travel all the way to a ganglia, an autonomic ganglia, that is within the peripheral nervous system. But these ganglia are much more distal. These are much further out within the periphery. And as a result, we have a longer preganglionic neuron and then we have a much shorter postganglionic neuron because the ganglia are so close to the effector organs themselves. Right? Very different or opposite, I should say, to what we saw with the sympathetic nervous system, where we had shorter preganglionic neurons and longer postganglionic neurons. We have <clears throat> um, short postganglionic neurons because the ganglia are very close to the effector organ. And then we have much longer preganglionic neurons because these neurons have quite a distance to travel to get from the brain and spinal cord out to these ganglia, which are very close to the effector tissues. Any questions so far? Any questions? So essentially the anatomy of the parasympathetic nervous system is the opposite of what we saw with the sympathetic. Right. And just to reiterate here, those fibers are arising from the spinal cord, S2, S3, S4, and from the brain stem for cranial nerves 3, 7, 9, and 10. Let's talk a little bit about the nerves that are involved, the cranial nerves that are involved. The first one is the vagus nerve, cranial nerve 10. This is going to influence many of those affected tissues. Vagus is one of the most, uh, I want to say, uh, nerve that does a lot of that does a lot of work let's put it that way all right it's going to in innervate your lungs it's going to innervate your um pharynx it's going to innervate your heart and all of your gastrointestinal organs in terms of parasympathetic 
So the vagus nerve is a very long nerve. It comes from the medulla. It's going to go all the way through the pharynx, into the thoracic cavity, and eventually into the abdomen. And as you can see, this is how long that preganglionic neuron is. The second nerve is the ocular motor nerve, which influences your uh, eyes and the secretions of your eyes. Then there's a facial nerve, which does this, a similar job. So some of your salivary secretions are influenced by the facial nerve. And finally, your glossopharyngeal nerve, righty, which is your cranial nerve nine. So these four cranial nerves are the parasympathetic uh, division, and then S2, S3, S4. Now, just to, I'll point out here, the spinal nerves that are involved are S2, S3, S4. These are not your pelvic nerves. Pelvic nerves are different from S2, S3, S4. These are your uh, sacral nerves. Okay. All righty. Any questions so far? Okay. Now, um, autonomic nerves have a mixed composition. And what mixed composition really means is that the fibers in these nerves are traveling in two different directions. All right, we sort of talked about this last time. We talked about efferent fibers or efferent fibers, and we talked about afferent fibers. So we're going to explain the route that we talked about for both of these fibers. So what was the direction of efferent fibers? Yeah. Central nervous system. Good. So these fibers are moving from the central nervous system out into the affected tissue. What about the afferent fibers? These would be in the opposite direction. These are transmitting information from visceral receptors, right? So receptors on your blood vessels, receptors on your heart, receptors on your lungs, up to the central nervous system. So they're going to be telling the central nervous system information about things like your heart rate, things like your um, respiratory rate, all right? So sensory information that is being picked up from your visceral receptors that travels up to the central nervous system does so on afferent fibers with an A, whereas the effector tissues are going to receive the signal or the response, let's say, on efferent fibers that are coming from the central nervous system out to these effector tissues. So as a result, we can see how homeostasis is brought about by the mixed composition of these nerves. We have some fibers that are taking information from receptors and sending it to the nervous system. The nervous system will take that information, make some sort of decision and generate a response. The response will then be communicated on efferent fibers back out to those affected tissues. So this is a cycle of communication, and this is what really brings about homeostasis. We're going to look at an example later on on how that happens.